person standing trial over procurement breaches at uh, the Northern Development Authority. The bill. the bill was not opposed by the Office of Special Prosecutor and we are aware that they granted the bill, each of them 500,000 Ghana cities, three shortages to justify. More managers of retail giants arrested and detained by the Ghana Revenue Authority for non-compliance with tax law and bypassing the electronic VAT invoicing system. Once you are arrested, you take your statement, then somebody will come in and bail you. Then we will continue with our investigations. But we are looking forward to a speedy, you know. And still on CNR Extra, Cocoa Board reiterates its warning that most river bodies in the country risk extinction in the coming years due to illegal mining. And now we have to be important water to do everything, because the rivers will be no more. And Cobra will disappear, the Pra will disappear, the Ophain will disappear, the Brim, all these rivers are going to disappear. CNR Extra is live on CCTV, and as always, you can join us with your thoughts, submissions, and comments via WhatsApp line on 0204447033, and you can also join us on our stream on YouTube as we stream on CityTube. Jude Mensah Duncan, you are welcome to the show. Thank you so in much. In the month of February. Yeah, in the month of love. Are you yes, know, excited? Yes, 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 <laughs> excited. We, we've sat January. Hopefully, government will show us that love we've exactly, all been craving exactly, for exactly, in, exactly, in the new exactly. month. <laughs> and based on the love that we want government to show us, <laughs> let's go to the debt exchange program. Individual bondholders from they have rejected the new terms proposed by government in a debt exchange program. Let's bring you that insight. The Individual Bondholders Forum has rejected new terms proposed by government in the debt exchange program. Now, government has once again extended the deadline for the exchange to February 7, 2023, proposing new terms to individual bondholders, organized labor and pension funds trustees. The individual bondholders, however, say they prefer to hold on to the old bonds regardless of the likelihood of limited tradability. The following report has more. Government is working to get 80% of eligible bondholders to sign onto its domestic debt exchange program intended to restructure about 137 billion cities of domestic bonds as it seeks debt sustainability and an IMF board level approval for a $3 billion balance of payment support and 55% debt to GDP ratio by 2028. So far, Government has reached an agreement with the Ghana Association of Banks, the Ghana Insurers Association, and the Ghana Securities Industry Association on the new terms. But there is still resistance from other domestic investors, especially those with individual holdings and individuals with investments in collective investment schemes. These groups hold about 15 billion cities of bonds representing about 11% of the eligible bonds. They believe the debt operation can be successful without their inclusion. In the new proposal, government suggests that all individual bondholders who are below the age of 59 years will be offered instruments with a maximum maturity of 5 years instead of 15 years and a 10% coupon rate, whereas retirees, including those retiring in 2023, will be offered instruments with a maximum maturity of 5 years instead of 15 years and a 15% coupon rate. Next month, bonds amounting to more than 8 billion cities will be maturing and government will have to honor its obligation to investors who do not sign onto the exchange program. Government has therefore extended the expiration of the offer to February 7, 2023, but the individual bondholders still remain adamant about joining. Well, the uh, individual bondholders that are on our platforms so far are overwhelmingly uh, against the new terms that the uh, government has proposed through the finance minister. The reason for it is simple. 
the new terms, which is that they will issue five-year bonds and pay annual coupons at interest of 10%, it's not as good as what individual bondholders are currently holding. So in other words, the bondholders are currently holding. It's better than what has been put on the table. So they are not interested. And so they just pray that government will stick to its commitment, which has now been made public by the finance minister, that the existing bonds will be honest, that the coupons that the interest and the principals will be paid in default due. So once there's an assurance that the existing bonds that we are holding are good, are valid, are uh, binding on government, that's it. Individual bondholders want to hold on to those. So this is the fourth extension that government has done from uh, uh, January 31, that was the final one that government hoped to reach an agreement or that was a deadline for the program, mm. has been moved to the 7th of February. And government has indicated some uh, revised terms that has been uh, brought in connection to the program. I would want to share that with you before we have the conversation on it. It says that an affirmation uh, that all individual bondholders are free not to participate. And also, upon a successful domestic debt exchange program, there will be very few of the old bonds in circulation and likely limit to limit its tradability. Its tradability yeah. And also, in this regard, government is pleased to make available the following alternative offer to encourage all individual bondholders to participate in the exchange program. And uh, the alternative offers are all individual bondholders who are below the age of 59 years will be offered instruments with a maximum maturity of five years instead of 15 years and a 10% coupon rate. All retirees, including those retiring in 2023, will be offered instrument with a maximum maturity of five years instead of 15 years and a 15% coupon rate, among other um, offers that government mm -hmm. brought out. But I think that with all this, uh, it's obvious that a consultation is going on well, though some of the bondholders are asking um, their members, the conveners, I think Martin Kebu is asking his members not to sign on to the mm. program. Uh, Senor Husi, on the other hand, says that this is a massive improvement yeah. uh, when it comes to the revision that has been brought to the program. I mean, yeah, there's no two ways about the fact that this is definitely an improvement on what was earlier put out by the government of Ghana and, and the Ministry of Finance. I mean, particularly, I'm still looking forward to um, the exchange memorandum that will be put out by the Minister of Finance starts tomorrow. Mm. And as, um, I believe that will give us a better scope of uh, analysis, really, on what to expect going forward. I mean, Philip, yesterday we sat here and we predicted that Those looking at how um, the conversation was going and the reluctance of, of, of bondholders to sign on to it, there was definitely going to be an extension. And as after the show, and we saw that letter from the Ministry of Finance indicating same. I've always maintained that a lot more engagement needs to be done. Um, for me, it's quite unfortunate. If you listen to the conversations that has characterized um, this whole issues of our domestic um, debt exchange program, there's very little of um, technical people from government and the ministry leading the conversation. It's always the individual bondholders for mm -hmm. that senior mm -hmm. And 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 um, 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 lawyer Martin Pebu and also offering Dr. the Edu. public education mm. and and for me that is a worry. I expect that by now you'd expect the Minister of Finance to start leading a conversation, explaining to um, the ordinary Ghanaian what he really means. Go back to the revised um, 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 terms they've they've put out. Um, 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 option C, it says that when it lists the the alternatives really mm. it says all individual bondholders who are below the age of 59 years will be offered instruments with a maximum maturity of five years instead of 15 years i mean on a face value it definitely looks like an improved offer but i mean there are still more questions that needs to be answered so for me i, I think the conversation 
is progressing smoothly. Now, I think it's moved a little from whether or not you sign on to it to what the terms really are. So in the coming days, I expect a lot more conversation, a lot more engagement from government. And particularly, I also expect, I'm looking forward to the exchange memorandum. Mm. That will give us an idea or a scope of what to, to expect in this. I've heard some people in the industry, um, um, fund managers tell me that no matter what, they are going to refuse this. I mean, <laughs> yesterday I was having a conversation with some people in the industry and they were quite resolute in their thinking. They say it's no way they're not going to accept this. They feel like it's being forced down their neck. So it's, it puts us in a very precarious situation as a country. And I mean, go back in history. I feel this is the biggest um, 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 Scan not scandal, but the, the, it's, it's, it's the biggest um, struggle, for want of a better word, that has, hit, government. Yes, that has hit our final space in a, in a long time. Take the banking sector crisis away. Mm -hmm. I feel like this has the, the, the propensity really to collapse our finance space. So well, we really that, need to, that has been said by really one of to, the MPs indicating that this has the chance to affect private a, banks. A, exactly. And, and uh, we are just hoping that the consultation will go on well and also when it comes to the memorandum that will be signed mm -hmm. or that will be channeled out tomorrow, that is February 2, we will definitely be keeping you updated with whatever happens. But then again, the consultation is going down well. The government is doing it bit to ensure that at least uh, the institutions or the individual bondholders will sign on to uh, the debt exchange program. That is the domestic debt exchange program. Away from that, let's go to the Ghana Revenue Authority because uh, that department or agency isn't sleeping at all. Uh, it's still clamping down on outlets, retail outlets that are not conforming with uh, the e-voice or the VAT, uh, the electronic VAT voicing system. Let's bring you that insert. Managers of the East Legon branch of Maxmart Shopping Center, Community 25 branch of Palace Shopping Mall, and Second Cup Coffee Shop at Jolie have been arrested and detained by the Ghana Revenue Authority for non-compliance with tax laws and bypassing the electronic VAT invoicing system. Now, the two experts and a Ghanaian manager from the three retail outlets will be facing prosecution in the coming days, according to the Area Enforcement Manager for Accra Central of the Ghana Revenue Authority. Now, Fred Duho was part of the task force and bring us more. We are currently um, before the Maxmart shopping center here at East Legon, where early in the morning we started from the Palace Mall at Community 25 in Tema. And the manager has since been arrested, including uh, that of China Mall manager that was arrested yesterday. This exercise by GRA is basically to enforce compliance with their tax laws. And a number of shop owners have found some smart way of bypassing the electronic VAT invoice system that is put in place to check the issuance of VAT tickets to uh, customers per the item bought from their shops. And this, the GRA is hoping to clamp down and prosecute those uh, offenders. We are arresting the manager here. The reason is that we did a test purchase to find your compliance level. You know, you don't issue the written receipt. You yes. use the electronic one. Exactly. And then, for the investigation and the test purchase, we bought some goods from your, your outfit here. And the results indicate that you were duplicating the serial numbers, indicating that if you sell one product at S amount, then you sell about five products under the same serial number. So you account for only one. Are you getting me? Then the, the remaining product, you will not account to the authority how much you have Listen, listen. I get, I, get, I get your point. Is it clear? Yeah, I get your point. That is our finding. I get your point. This is the manager of Maxmat at East Legon with the tax force uh, moving straight to the vehicle where he would be um, taken to the main GRA office and handed over to the um, CID to take charge and proceed with um, interactions and investigations. He would be basically um, prosecuted. We've come to the third location, which is Second Cup Coffee Company here at Jowulu. And the manager, who is the lady in the black top and down, is being escorted to the van to join the other two persons that were earlier on arrested by the tax force. So this 
is basically the third location we've been in the day so far and they are dealing with shop specific um, centers so for instance if you have branches at other places they would deal with the exact shop or branch that is violating the tax laws so basically you can see she's been escorted to the van that we have three people in there two white guys or two uh, experts and now one uh, Ghanaian. What we are doing now is branch specific. So you could have the same company appearing almost every day because it's about a branch. If the branch is not doing as expected, then we pick up a manager of that particular branch. So today we went to Jowulu. That is a branch of Fresh First Limited. That is into bracket. We have they are, they are the same people as Second Cup. And the offense electronic VAT invoice. Then we went to Maxmat. Invoice. And then we went to Palace Shopping Mall. They are duplicating the serial numbers. So you have maybe three, four invoices bearing the same serial number. So that is surely an offense. What it means is that even if any of the receipts should be reported at our end, it will only be just one. The rest will not be captured by our system. So they are shortchanging us, and it's a crime. But what happens is that once you are arrested, we take your statement, then somebody will come in and bail you. Then we will continue with our investigations. But we are looking forward to a speedy you know, a trial. So we are trying to put our dockets together as early as possible so that we can take them to court. We are looking at a maximum of 1,500 penalty units. That is the maximum you could go. That is if there was no assessment to it. And then we are also looking at an imprisonment not more than five years or a combination of both. But then if we are able to establish the taxes payable, then the penalty will be three times that, you know, assessment. Because we all started this program together. And it started 1st of October. The do's and don'ts are there. We are not supposed to do this. We are supposed to issue only Commissioner General certified, uh, you know, receipts. We have asked them to write their statement. Their lawyers come and then they explain whatever happened. If We continue questioning them. Even getting them onto the system was a challenge. And you and I, we were, you were in, on our team. Getting them to just, re, I mean, get hooked onto our system, they refused until we started locking up their places. And then when we got them, finally got them onto the system, they have they started passing our back. Yesterday, four people were arrested. Today, three, making it seven. And according to the team lead, this exercise would continue until all those who are bypassing the system are arrested and made to face prosecution. My name is Fred Duo reporting for City News. So the Ghana Revenue Authority has indicated that all retail outlets that are bypassing their system will be fished out. Uh, it looks like it's something that uh, the authority is not relaxing at all because mm. uh, as of uh, Monday, they embarked mm. on the exercise. Uh, Tuesday, they did the same. Mm. I don't know if they are doing the same today, but they are ensuring that every retail outlet that is not complying with yeah. their uh, electronic tax invoicing system yeah is arrested and it looks like that is going down well with the various managers but i may i was asking yesterday if you're a manager of a retail outlet and you are seeing that this is what they are doing to other places why don't you do what is the need for i mean there's an excessive desire to make profit and you understand why certain people um, would want to go past the law i mean with this particular story with one of these retail outlets you understand that and um, they were recording multiple sales of items under one unit mm. but per the gra's directive every single um, unit or item sold should come with its own um but in um, um invoice so yes. um for me it's criminal 
if somebody is engaging in an act like this, it's, it's purely criminal and the law should take its course. I mean, I'd want to commend the audacity of the GRA to go against all odds, take them on, ensure their prosecution in court. Some of these, you understand, sir. Uh, experts who are engaged in it. I mean, it, it makes it a little dicey, but they've shown a lot of courage, they've shown a lot of boldness. But I mean, go back to their books, 2021, yesterday, 1.7 billion in terms of revenue mobilization and tax accrued. 2022, their, 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 their targets during the 2022 media budget was revised downwards to some 71 billion. At the end, they accrued some 75.5 billion Ghana cities, a nominal growth of 31.5%. I mean, it would take some courage and some boldness to be making these figures. So, first, personally, I want to commend um, um, Dr. Amis Adai, mm. and the team. I think they are doing a fantastic job. We've always maintained on this show that, see, for a nation to grow, you need people paying your taxes. Mm. And looking at the, 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 the problem or the structure of our economy, is such that a lot of people are not paying taxes. So the easy target should not be let loose. And when people are trying to take advantage of the system, I feel like the law should take its course. So I want to commend the GRA. I feel like they shouldn't relent in their efforts to making sure that they sanitize the system. And they are doing exactly that. Uh, they are they're actually doing exactly that, and they are trying to sanitize the system. But I also urge the retail outlets that <laughs> at least do what is needful so that you would save yourself this embarrassment. Because if you're, the name of an institution or the name of your outlet is mentioned in the media space and that you're not conforming to, with what is supposed to be done appropriately, I think it's, it's in a way affects your mm -hmm. image or it tarnishes your image as an organization. So do what is needful. And it looks like the Ghana Revenue Authority is not going to relent on its efforts to ensure that the right thing mm. is done. Let's move away from uh, that story and go to the northern region where uh, the High Court sitting in Tamale has granted bill to two uh, bill of two million Ghana cities with three sureties to four accused persons standing trial in the case of the Northern Development Authority. The High Court sitting in Tamale has granted bail of two million Ghana cities with three charities each to the four accused persons standing trial in the case of the Northern Development Authority NDA procurement breaches revealed in the Special Prosecutor's Investigative Report. Now Northern Regional Correspondent Daina Ngwan was in court and comes through with this report. The defendants were charged on six counts, including a joint count of conspiracy to commit the criminal offense of directly or indirectly influencing the procurement process to obtain unfair advantage in the award of a procurement. The accused persons, namely Smaila Abdurrahman, the NDA CEO, and two of his deputies, Stephen Yeyu and Patrick Seydu, and the CEO of ANQ's consortium, Andrew Kudari, all pleaded not guilty to the charges. The counsel for the defendants in their opening prayed the court for a bail, even though the prosecution did not oppose the bail. She prayed the court to seize the passport of the accused persons. However, the first accused, the CEO of NDA, has been barred from traveling outside Ghana until he produces his passport after two weeks. Secondly, the accused persons are to justify the bill conditions by providing documents covering landed properties worth 500,000 cities each at the registry with an undertaking that such properties are free from challenges. The counsel for the second and third accused spoke to the media after proceeding. Uh, it was a very friendly atmosphere. The special prosecutor's office was represented by the deputy and different lawyers represented the different clients. That's the four accused persons. So as you are very much aware, in open court, uh, when the charges were read, there were six charges leveled against the four persons. And when the charges were read, all of them pleaded not guilty. And so everything has fallen in issue for trial to determine their guilt or otherwise. Now, having read the charges and having pleaded not guilty, and again, the facts having been read, uh, the court gave us the opportunity to make a submission for bail, which the lawyers agreed I should do so on their behalf, and I did. And the court duly granted them bail. The bail was not opposed by the Office of Special Prosecutor, and you are aware that they granted them bail, each of them 500,000 Ghana cities, three shortages to justify. 
and then they should deposit their passport. The case has been adjourned to 28 for case management, and thereafter the judge says that every week we're going to have three days of hearing for an expeditious trial so that we can determine the issues effectively. Well, I think that is the, the best thing that he has actually stated. That's what all of us are looking for. You know, the accused persons are going to be living with this, you know. to establish either their guilt or innocence, then the matter is effectively determined and then everybody can go their way. So that is why I agree absolutely with the trial judge that there's a need for an expeditious trial on the matter. The criminal prosecution of the four follows a directive by the Office of the Special Prosecutor after an investigation was conducted into suspected corruption and corruption-related offenses at the Northern Development Authority this was in relation to a contract awarded to a consultancy company, a and Q Consortiums, under the Infrastructure for Poverty Eradication Program. The complaint, which was filed by a private legal practitioner, Martin Kebu, accused the chief executive officer of NDA, Smaila Abdurrahman, and two of his deputies of procurement breaches. The report by the OSP revealed that the actions of the four directly and indirectly influenced the procurement breaches. The report added that the initial contract sum of 5,720,000 cities was illegally increased by 4,680,000 cities, amounting to a total of 10,400,000 cities without following the due process. Court has adjourned the case to February 28 for case management to commence. From Tamale, I am Daina Nguan. for case management mm -hmm. and uh, the criminal prosecution of the four follows a directive by the office of the special prosecutor after an investigation was conducted into the suspected corruption and corruption related offenses at uh, the northern development authority and listen to this this was in relation to a contract awarded to a consultancy company a and q's consortium under the infrastructure <laughs> for Poverty eradication program. But then again, it's, it's, it's been adjourned, so we, we, I don't know. We, we wonder why any government initiative towards curbing mm. unemployment yes, and tackling poverty, poverty yes. remains a sham. I mean, see, go through the Auditor General's report every year. Procurement breaches happen to be like one of the mainstay. Every time you see an issue with regards to procurement breaches here and there, it's become a very fertile avenue for a lot of corruption and rot in the public mm. service. And it's quite unfortunate. I mean, on this particular case, we understand the complaint in this, um, who sent, uh, who raised, who blew the whistle. In this was a lawyer, Martin. Lawyer Martin the same convener for the bond. I mean, he's, what a busy, <laughs> what a busy period it's been, man. it's been for him. But I mean, Philip, more importantly, mm. when President Anai Kufado appointed Honorable Sarah Joa Safo as the Minister in charge of Minister of State in charge mm. of pu public procurement, procurement yes. for me, I thought it was a great initiative at the time to really look at what the problem is and try address it head on. But of course, after four years uh, and a failed attempt at tackling it, it's been scrubbed off, and the problem still persists. I mean, I would commend Martin Pebu for being a citizen vigilante and looking at some of these things and raising the alarm. He wasn't, course, a, he wasn't a spectator, he's a citizen. He's a citizen yeah. and, and, and the special prosecutor's office for following up. I mean, issue, yeah. inflating contracts into millions, running into millions of CDs, it's, 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 it's a serious issue. And the matter is still in court, so we don't want yeah. to um, um, comment further this. until the court, of course, comes out to decide on it. Exactly. So, um, February 28th, just stay with us here. We will certainly bring you all the updates on that particular particular story. You are still watching CNR Extra on City TV, still to come. Cocoa Board reiterates warning that most river bodies in the country risk extinction in the coming years due to illegal mining. Kindly stay with us. We'll be back with more stories.
Plus is a fully skimmed evaporated milk. Creamy Plus is available in a shop near you. This message has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Many thanks for still staying with us here on CNR Extra or on CCTV. You can join us with your contribution, thoughts, and comments on our WhatsApp line 0204447033. The issue of illegal mining, also known as the Galamse, isn't moving out anytime soon because Cocoa Board has reiterated its warning that if that practice is not stopped, uh, river bodies risk extinction. Let's bring you that ESET. The Ghana Cocoa Board Cocoa Board says most river bodies in the country risk extension in the coming years due to the activities of illegal mining known as Galamse. Now Cocoa Board says a lot of the river bodies have been heavily polluted with silt. Speaking of the Public Accounts Committee sitting in Parliament, the Chief Executive Officer of Cocoa Board, Joseph Boahin Edu, bemoaned the devastating impact of Galamse on cocoa farms. City News is Ni Ayukin Okan has more in this report. During proceedings on Tuesday by the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament, the Ghana Cocoa Board, Cocoa Board appeared before it to answer questions pertaining to infractions cited in the 2020 Auditor General's report and the Chief Executive Officer of Cocoa Board, Joseph Boahin Edu, indicated that river bodies stand to be depleted in the coming years. Do in the years time, Ghana will have to be important water to do everything, because the rivers will be no more. And Cobra will disappear, the Pra will disappear, the Ophain will disappear, the brim, all these rivers are going to disappear. That's one. The other aspect had to do with ourselves, because we have a lot of mercury also being discharged, which poses a lot of health risk for, you know, human beings, not just those who live in these uh, corridors or enclaves, but it extends to those of us even living here in Accra. There is no galamsey taking place in Accra. For the cocoa sector in particular, the chairman, now it's difficult for us to even carry on irrigation. You cannot use boreholes to do irrigation. You have to use surface runoff. All over the world, irrigation is done through surface runoff. But all these rivers are polluted, they are contaminated, so that you cannot use such waters. And farmers are now, cocoa farmers, now have to, you know, transport water from their homes to the farms. They have to use a boboya to, you know, carry water. It's even be making cocoa farming to become very expensive. He also commented on a recent report filed by an international media firm, Al Jazeera, on the use of child labor in the cocoa sector in Ghana. Uh, apparently, um, you know, the reporter went to this village in the western region and then, you know, organized the community from a church service. They were even in a church service on Sunday, took them to the farm and then directed what they should do, including a four-year-old child to be picking cocoa pots. Uh, chairman, ordinary, no Ghanaian, no Ghanaian, you know, what uh, his or her thought will allow a four-year-old child to go and work on a cocoa farm. Yes. And this is exactly what, and also on a Sunday, this is exactly what Al Jazeera, you know, uh, broadcast to the whole world for a whole day on hourly basis. For the um, the, the, the Western uh, media, they see this as child labor, and this is reported. When any child is using a cutlass, a knife, even for peeling the plantain or for peeling yam or cassava, 
that's also exposing this child to uh, hazardous work. And these are the kind of things that they are reporting. Um, ignorant about our cultural values. And some of our own people have bought into this. And they are rather championing these negative, uh, you know, reporting at the international media. We think, at the end of the day, it is not cocoa board. It is, it is about the image of Ghana's cocoa that is being destroyed. And when that is done, you go to the market, the traders are not prepared to touch Ghana cocoa. And then it means that then if the, nobody is buying... The, the is uh, exacting on the industry. It has wider ramification in terms of price and then what we can give to our farmers. My name is Ni Ayukwe Okan. The issue of river bodies disappearing as a result of illegal mining uh, didn't start today. And it, it looks like most organizations are echoing this. The Food and Beverages Association came out to say that this will affect their operations. Also, we've, we've had a lot of individuals stating about it. Uh, Daryl Bosso's uh, group, that is uh, Arocha, yeah. has also stated, spoke up, spoken about it. Um, farmers are talking about it. Cocoa farmers are talking about it. The Cocoa Board is also talking about yeah. it. Uh, it looks like, uh, I don't know, but government also, also says that a lot of activities are being done to ensure that this activity is kept. I mean, for all the people that have commented about it, the most profound um, and also statement. the sanitation ministry, that is a water and sanitation minister, Cecilia Abnadapa, has also spoken about it. Yeah, I mean, from a water, water yes. um, security... And the Ghana Water Company I mean, Limited as well. For all the people, really, that have commented on this particular menace that's fast taking on our country and, and threatening our very survival as a people, for me, the most profound one came from Professor Gordon um, mm. from the University of Ghana when he said that Galamse basically and very uh, it's a mental problem and and for me i couldn't agree more yes we i couldn't agree more with him because if you if you understand the psyche of some of the people that engage in it you, you really have a lot more questions and and there are no answers i feel the problem we've still as a people not appreciated the gravity and the, the, the severity of the issue. And in the coming years, maybe we would. But see, we need to get our act together as a people. If you go to some of these Galamse pits, and, and for me, I've seen some before after a recent travel. It's, 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 it's the words, it's, on, it's serious mm, and mm. very unfortunate. And recently, I, I think on a city breakfast show mm. at uh, Akwesija Enim, the mm. Western Regional Correspondent, CTFM, CTTV, he indicated that uh, Galamse is still going on. When you travel along some stretches in, the, in that region, you see it's, that it's uh, as pits though, are it's left as though, It's as though... There's so what is happening? Uh, all the, all I, I the things that is being that have been said by government, we are having helicopters, we are having drones, we are having uh, officers on the river bodies and all that. See, what I, is happening? I, I always say that in this country, right, we have some sort of a high blood pressure for creed and a very and an anemia for deeds. So you see, government come up with interministerial committee on illegal mining. We bought speed boats. We are doing this, but you go on the ground and the action is almost non-existent and that has been our being as a people in terms of our fight against Galamsey. There's a lot of talk with little action to follow and I mean you see us do very elaborate conferences on how we are going to tackle Galamsey uh, from government. Then at the f a following week or a month later I want to check up with some of the action plan laid out and there's almost nothing happening. So it's a lot of talk with less action mm -hmm. and, and, and I still want to throw this challenge to the presidency. I, I really hope he still puts his presidency on the line. I feel like he has a really huge tax and well, whatever I think it the is, president has also his legacy, his legacy, a number of things are being yeah, done I mean, about His it. legacy will be defined on how or not, of course, the economy is big, but whether or not he ensured that our, our survival as a people was, 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 let me, let me not go there, but well, I'm saying that his, his legacy. If, if the 
Ghana Cocoa Board is coming out to say that uh, river bodies may disappear. Then it looks like the issue is because getting Because, Philip, see, it's an, ex it's an existential threat, and there mm. are no two ways about that. So, to a very large extent, I feel the president should still be very much committed to this. I well, mean, he's met with the MMCs, MMBAs, he's met with the chiefs. I mean, there's some the action. Some of the chiefs are also in He's there. committed some action to it, but I, 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 I demand a lot more from him. And for me, I feel like it should be one of the things top three on this on this priority when he wakes up every morning about how to deal with Galamse because of the very fact that it threatens our existence as a people. Well, and also other state officials who are in charge directly, the Lands and Natural Resources Ministry, we know you are doing well, but maybe you also have to sit up more because it looks like what is coming from uh, Cocoa Board and uh, the Ghana Water Company Limited has also set sail. One on one in the future, we may be importing water. That is going to be very, very sad in, in this part of the world, and that is Ghana. Mm -hmm. Let's move away from Galamse issues and let's go to uh, the Kolobu Teaching Hospital because the doctors there. Uh, are threatening to embark on a strike if their management fail to pay them their 13th <laughs> month salary. Let's bring you that insight. The Kolebu Doctors Association has threatened to withdraw services of outpatient department from next Monday due to management's failure to meet the agreed deadline on a memorandum of understanding between the Ghana Medical Association and the Ministry of Health regarding payment of their 13th month salary. Now, in December 2022, the Kolebu Doctors Association, in a letter, told Kolebu management not to make any unilateral payments of 25% of their arrears unless clear timelines for payment had been agreed upon. Now, they also failed to meet a January 27 deadline to revert with timelines for the settlement of the outstanding arrears. Chairman of the association, Dr. Frank Ousu Setra, says he hopes management resolves the situation soon to avert an escalation of the strike. We had a meeting on the 29th of Sunday, and the consensus was that no. All we are saying is that you can pay 25% now, fine. Give us a timeline for the payment of the other so that we can take you on. But you can't just be silent that we take it or leave it at that. Give you 25% and that's it. This is our conditions of service. You just can't vary our conditions of service in the last. And that is why we are where we are. To be fair to manage, I don't think they've had enough time to even look at it to a plan. We are hoping that within the week, we should be able to, I mean, we are a bunch of reasonable people. Why can't we sit and then uh, come out with a consensus instead of, you know, uh, what, what we are witnessing? I'm really embarrassed about the fact that this is being discussed in the media. I am hoping after the one week uh, we will be able to say we've, we've reached a consensus. So should management of uh, the Kolobu Teaching Hospital and also the uh, Ghana Health Service, uh, the Ministry of Health, fail to pay the doctors their 13th month salary, uh, that is the Kolobu Teaching Hospital, uh, they will withdraw their services at the outpatient department from next Monday. And speaking to Dr. Frank Owusu Setra, who is a chairman of the association, he indicated that uh, the sit-down strike or redrawing of their services at the outpatient department will last for a week after it will be taken up another top notch. <laughs> but then again, he indicated that if an engagement as uh, sort of hard be gotten between uh, the various stakeholders involved, definitely they are going to rescind their decision because it looks like what it wants is commitment from the various stakeholders to ensure that this money will be paid. I mean, 13 months salary must be really nice to, to <laughs> must be really nice to to be a doctor in this country. Yeah, but I mean, uh, on to more serious issues, I feel. Generally, we've not taken our healthcare workers in this country seriously at all. And and for me, these little incentives to keep them going and to keep them pushing and, and delivering under very unfavorable conditions for me is something that we should be willing as a people to, to, to give in. And I'm talking about government. I feel government should 
be in a position to at least incentivize um, some of these healthcare workers with these little demands here and there. Because already there's there's really nothing to write them about with regards to um, compensations and salaries of healthcare workers in this country. Already we are dealing with a serious problem of um, the exodus of healthcare workers um, going looking for better opportunities overseas. And for those who remain here, the little we can do is to really support them not only monetary wise but also in terms of the conditions of service making sure that they are working with the right equipment they are working with the right tools and of course compensate them well i mean you see it's it's, it's 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 nothing to write them about you talk to some of them on a personal level and you'll be really surprised as to the 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 they are worth of their service in terms of monetary um, value when they tell you some of these things and you will be here elections will come there's a change of government and some boy who was some PA to some minister <laughs> the PA of the PA the, <laughs> the minister's PA has a PA mm -hmm. who is driving some some really spotty posh vehicle so now and, and now, <laughs> now you side with me when I say all, all this boils down to the fact that the monetary <laughs> thing is not going down well because uh, the exodus <laughs> of health workers uh, <laughs> follows all these things because you are you don't you don't the, give me the needed incentive you I, don't give me what I, i'm expected I, I to totally, get as, as a doctor I, or I, I as totally a health practitioner and i get a better offer somewhere and you think i will not go <laughs> yeah. i will go but See. it's like some of them have also kept it okay fine we would have to serve our nation so we have to be in here but this 13th man salary thing i think that if the various authorities would have to check it i'm uh, this one is not like i'm siding with the doctors but i have to side with them i mean because like, if they have to work um some of them have to work maybe morning evening emergencies and some of them even work on emergencies and they have to come to the If this is not coming from back, the various quarters, go back I think the, that it's an issue that has to be raised. To, go back to the report Caleb Kuda did yes. on the exodus of um, um, Ghanaian health workers. Um, there was this young um, health professional in interview, and she was, she was clear and emphatic. For her, it's about a passion. It's about saving lives and helping the mm, country. Mm. And for me, for people like that, we need to reward them. Society needs to find a way to ensure that their sacrifices are not in vain. And, 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 and the little we can do, really, is to incentivize them, is to give them this money here and there. Philip, the thing I'm telling you about, the PSP, it's, it's serious. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a serious issue. Yeah, so you Italy. see, the doctor who has worked for, say, 13 years and we have worked for 20 we'll years, nothing. has nothing and to PS, show. The, and the, the PSP the of the politician PSP has all the things. Putting but up some again, really uh, elaborate house. <laughs> Let's leave the, the, the various stakeholders, please do well to, to check it for the doctors of the Kolibu Teaching Hospital because uh, we are just uh, trying to add our voice to it so that this will be resolved. Because if uh, they redraw their services at the outpatient department, it's going to be chaotic. The number of people that rely on the services of these doctors at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital are many. Uh, you are still watching CNR Extra on City TV, still to come. Refugees living in uh, the Boku in uh, the Upper East region appeal for support to assist them with basic necessities of life until they are able to return to their country. Kindly stay with us. We'll be back with that story. It's City on the Go. You don't have to miss any of your favorite television and radio shows on City TV and City FM. Enjoy thrilling content from your world of great television and relevant radio at your convenience. Subscribe to City Tube on YouTube. Turn on your notification button and receive prompts on our live streaming sessions and new content uploads. For easy access to the City Tube page, scan the barcode on your screens. Subscribe to the City you page and voila unlimited content awaits you don't forget to subscribe to city tube for amazing content from city tv and city fm
Many thanks for staying with us here on CNR Extra on CCTV. Let's bring you our final story and let's move to the Upper East region where refugees at the Boko West District are asking government to support them. Let's bring you that insight. Now with some other news, refugees living in the Boko West District of the Upper East Region are appealing to the government and humanitarian organizations to assist them with basic necessities of life until they are able to return to their country. The over 3,000 refugees from neighboring Burkina Faso have been forced out of their country by activities of violent extremists and are thus seeking support to cater for their families. City News' Upper East Regional Correspondent Frederick Awuni has more in this report. Activities of violent extremists in neighboring Burkina Faso in recent times have led to the death of Burkina Bay residents and displaced over 3,000, including women and children. These refugees have sought asylum in Sapelega in the Boko West district of the Upper East region. Housed in an uncompleted structure, these refugees are exposed to health hazards, poor shelter, and depend solely on donated foodstuff from local residents or non-governmental organizations. But the support they get is woefully inadequate to meet their daily needs. Some of the refugees share with City News how they came into Ghana. The presiding member of the Boku West District Assembly, Awini Asana Zakari, fears the situation threatens the security of the area and called for tight security surveillance. Do I think that upon government intervention, all that we are doing, I think government is aware and then I also really want to know that if government comes in, like the security person, the community is, in fact, we are being threatened, we are being threatened. So despite the number of security personnel on ground, we are still not certified. Some, some of the unapproved rules are still scary. And so I think that when the security uh, deployment is being put in place, it will, it will help us. So refugees. would want to help them following what is happening in their country in the uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, I think it's a step in the right direction that you would want to lend a helping hand to these individuals who are uh, not safe in their country for that reason. They are mm. seeking refuge in Ghana. I mean, Philip, go back to the International um, Conventions on Refugees, um, 1951. And even here in Ghana, our Refugees um, Act, I mean, it's nothing like what, it doesn't stipulate anything we saw there. The conditions under which these um, um, refugees who've left their countries fleeing and the political instability there have to deal with here is, 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 is not the best. Mm. Their conditions, like you saw in the videos, is really not the best at all. For me, I feel and I, I'm quite convinced that there should be a deliberate um, um, approach with regards to their monitoring and their assimilation into society. Mm. I mean... Mm. We need to even interview them, their experiences, what they've been exposed to, and know the kind of people we are allowing into our society. And of course, ensure their comfort and their easy assimilation. Because, I mean, look at what's happen happening in the sub-region. The, 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 the inst instances of um, um, terror activities going on, instances of political instability, all of these things 
have the long way of in the long in the long run have a way of coming back to bite at us if we don't take the necessary precautions so i feel we should monitor very efficiently we should ensure that we are deliberate about the assimilation process so that we don't repeat the mistakes of some countries neighboring us well and that also also comes down to ask the citizens of ghana because this morning i think i received a message from national security saying that see something say, say, something. say something so when you see something in your area which is not not kindly say something because uh, though the refugees will become like Jude said, uh, they would have to be interviewed, they have to be interrogated, questions will have to be asked and all that. And also they're asking for a helping hand. If you have that means, you may as well want to help them, but help them in the right way. This is how we end today's edition of CNR Extra on City TV. My name is Philip Nihilati. I did this with Jude Mensah Duncan. Same time, join us tomorrow. Keep watching City TV.